ready, Katie? Yep. Good. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, as the chair of the Planning Commission, I'm going to start the meeting of uh, the Planning Commission, and we'll start with a roll call. Jackie, please. Commissioner Newman? Here. Commissioner Smith? Here. Commissioner Welch? Here. Commissioner Westman? Here. Chairperson Story? Here. And would you join me in standing for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> I want to announce that this meeting is cable cast live on Charter Communications, Cable TV Channel 8, and AT&T U-verse Channel 99. It's being recorded and will be replayed uh, on next Monday and Friday at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. The meeting can also be viewed at the city's website, which is www.cityofcapitola.org. Uh, tonight, our technician is Victor Herman. Uh, thank you, Victor. And I just want to remind everyone, if you could please turn off your cell phones. And if you come up to the podium, uh, please sign in so we can have your name for the record. Um, with that, let's uh, move on to oral communications, which is next on the agenda. And we'll consider additions and deletions to the agenda. Commissioners have any additions or requested deletions. Hearing none, uh, staff? Chairperson's story, I'd like to um, room delete 4C item for 115 San Jose Avenue, the parklet application that has been withdrawn by both parties. So is there a motion to delete item 4C? I'll move the motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion passes unanimously. <coughs> Um, uh, hearing no other additions or deletions for tonight, we'll move on now to public comments. This is an opportunity for members of the public to address the Planning Commission on items that are not on tonight's agenda. Does anybody would like to speak to the Commission? Hearing none, let's move on. Um, we'll next go to Commission comments. Commissioners, you have uh, comments, updates, reports, questions? I just have one question for Katie um, for an update on the, we call it the Hobby House on um, Capitola Road. I believe it's 4960, I think is the number. Yep, um, 4960 Capitola Road. This property, as you all know, has been in the courts and it recently went under receivership um, with conditions for the permit. Um, there are three deadlines set for the homeowner in which they were going to act as the personal contractor to finish um, within three certain deadlines that had specific items that had to be addressed to at each deadline during an inspection. Upon completion of those deadlines, um, which I have here, the last deadline is September 12th, 2018. The home will be inspected and if everything is in compliance, the homeowner will get a certificate of occupancy and there'll be um, some significant liens against the home for the efforts the city has had to go through legally. Um, if uh, on September 12th, the um, inspection fails, at that point it would go into the receivership and they would decide the fate of the building in the future. So. You think so you, you may be seeing progress <coughs> out there. Thank you. Maybe you'll give us an update after the inspection. Right. Yes. Thank you. Um, uh, next, we'll move on to staff comments. Does uh, staff have any comments or introductions they would like to make? <laughs> I do. Um, it's my honor to introduce Sasha Landry. Uh, Sasha Landry is a native to the Santa Cruz area and she was hired, she began work this Monday. Uh, Planner Landry was selected, selected from a large pool of applicants. In 2009, she graduated with a Bachelor of, of Arts from UC Santa Cruz with a focus on American studies. Uh, more recently, this past May, 
She earned her master's in urban planning at San Jose State University. Um, Sasha has, has successfully completed internships with the city of Santa Cruz and with Metro. So she got uh, great recommendations from both organizations and her professors at school, and we're so happy to have her. So welcome, well, welcome, 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 welcome Sasha. Yes. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, and next um, you see another new face. Um, and this is Chloe Woodmanson, and Chloe is our records coordinator. And Chloe, how long have you been with the city at this point? Since November. Since November. So um, whenever your questions come up for any records on a property, Chloe will be happy to help you out with those. And she's been also a welcome addition to the team. Welcome, uh, welcome Chloe. Yeah. Any other staff comments? That's it. Great. Thank you. Next, we'll move on to the consent calendar. This item will be handled uh, with one vote uh, without um, any um, um, lengthy discussion, unless someone chooses to pull it from our agenda uh, for uh, discussion. Do commissioners wish to pull any consent item? There's only one, but being none, I'll does move the consent agenda. And, um, um, is there a second? I'll second it. Before we vote on that, let me ask, do any members of the public wish to remove this item from the consent agenda for further discussion? Hearing none, I'll bring it back for um, a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <coughs> the motion passes unanimously, Jackie. Next, we'll move on to public hearings. Um, the first public hearing is uh, uh, under A. Um, are uh, considerations of sign permit for two wall signs at 105 Stockton Avenue in the Central Village Zoning District. That's, um, and um, we'll begin with a staff presentation. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you know, this came before you last month as a, an amendment to a master sign program. Um, you asked, and the applicant was not present, so you asked that we speak with the applicant, speak with the building owner, and bring this back as a sign permit instead. Um, so that's what we did. The applicant submitted a sign permit application for two wall signs for the existing commercial space located at 105 Stockton Avenue in the CV Central Village Zoning District. There is an exa existing master sign program for that commercial building. The applicant is proposing to add a second wall sign on the east elevation along Riverview Avenue, which is not currently allowed under that master sign program. The master sign program establishes the allowed materials, letter style, height, color, and illumination of signs for multi-tenant buildings. A MSP is approved by the Planning Commission with subsequent approvals administered by the Community Development Director. The master sign program for 103 and 105 Stockton allowed a wall sign located on the copper awnings in front of the business along Stockton Avenue, approximately 27 inches tall by 10 feet long, with capital letters being 18 inches. A wall sign located and a wall sign located on the existing copper awning on the side of the business along the Riverview Path, approximately 24 inches by tall by 8 feet long, with capital letters being 15 inches. Letter, style, and sign color were to be subject to the Community Development Director's approval. The two current Armida wall signs in the locations described in the master sign program shown here are both 24 inches high and 8 feet long with capital letters less than 12 inches in height. The size, shape, color, and texture of the signs are also complementary to the overall design of the building. The applicant is proposing to add a new wall sign in front of the business along Stockton Avenue that meets the original size requirements approved under the master sign program of 27 inches tall by 10 feet wide. The applicant is also proposing a second wall sign on the east elevation along Riverview Avenue, which is not currently allowed under the master sign program. Prior to the applicant meeting, uh, submitting revised designs, city staff informed the applicant that at the June 7th, 2018 meeting, the planning commission had requested that the applicant bring back two sign designs matching the 24 inch high by eight foot wide signs in place at 103 Stockton Avenue. Staff also informed the applicant that several members of the Planning Commission disapproved of the stark white background and asked that the applicant consider different colors that fit with the building and existing signage in the area. The applicant's proposal includes one 27-inch high by 10-foot wide wall sign on the Stockton Avenue side of the building and one 27-inch high by 10-foot wide wall sign on the Riverview Avenue side of the building. The sign material for both signs would be aluminum dye bond, which is the same material as the two existing illegal signs, 
and the lettering height would be approximately six inches on the top and smaller on the second line, though the applicant did not specify what that letter height was. Uh, the colors would be the same white background, turquoise border, and black text as the existing signs. The proposed 27 inch tall by 10 foot wide sign dimensions for the new wall sign on Stockton Avenue, which is five inches shorter and two feet wider than the existing illegal signs shown on this slide, which were approved under the 2002 master sign program, would be out of balance with the other tenant signs. Under Capitola Municipal Code, uh, Central Village signs should relate to their surroundings in terms of size, shape, color, texture, and lighting so that they are complementary to the overall design of the building and are not in visual competition with other conforming signs in the area. In addition to being larger than the signage at 103 Stockton Avenue, the proposed design of the sign with stark white background makes it appear even larger. Staff recommends that the Planning Commission limit the size of both signs to 24 inches high by 96 inches wide, or 2 feet by 8 feet. Staff supports the request for a second sign on the wall adjacent to Riverview Avenue because the applicant is on a corner parcel and allowing a second sign along Riverview Avenue is an allowance that currently exists for wall signs on corner lots in the Capitola Municipal Code. Uh, under the code, businesses which are located adjacent to two streets or a corner shall be permitted one additional wall sign to face the second adjacent street if the business is not identified on a monument sign. So staff recommends the Planning Commission review application 180170 and approve the sign application as conditioned, limiting the sign size of the two signs to 24 inches wide by 96 inches each. Commissioners have questions on the staff report? Question for staff. Yeah. Um, so would there still be a master sign program for this building after we do this? Or are we basically removing that? Yes, um, unless the Planning Commission chose to void it be a condition due to the fact that you'd be, if you went with the recommendation, allowing a second wall sign that would directly contradict the program that's in place now, um, it could be removed. Thank you. And I, sh I should add that the owner had no problems with whatever the Planning Commission chose to do in terms of the master sign program or the, these two signs in particular. So, so you could effectively condition it to, remo to n void the master sign program? Mm -hmm. Any other questions on the staff report? Okay, hearing none, um, I'm actually I'm going to open it up to the public now. Are there uh, representatives um, from the business or the old building owner that would like to address the commission? Hi, yes. Good evening. My Come name up. is Bahan Chakari, and so I'm the uh, business owner. Good and evening. Welcome. Thank yeah. you very much. So it's good to be in Capitola. So, um, so I guess are you saying you're allowing or? In, in your discussion to allow a sign on the second side and limit the size of the sign by 24 by, is that what, what's being said, 24 inches by 8 feet? Or? Well, that's still to be determined. The okay. commission hasn't actually discussed it at okay. this point um, and um, uh, made a final decision. Okay. Right. But I think that what you've heard is the staff has recommended that, the, uh, that it be allowed, but with a reduction in the sign to 2 feet by 8 feet. Okay. All right. And we took out the whiteboard on the side, so the theme of the business is, you know, it's basically a bath and, you know, uh, okay. body shop, right? So it's personal care items and, you know, the ocean is turquoise, the, you know, the bath products are white, so kind of it goes with the theme of the business. So that's, you know, so we removed the white on the outside to make it appear less white, if you will, and made a wider border, so hopefully that works. And the lettering doesn't quite represent, we're looking at making it slightly larger to I think what Matt said in the order of about six inches right now, it's about four and a half inches, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Okay. Anything further you wanna? No, I'm just, you know, we're happy to be in, in Capitola and you know, it's been a little challenging because there was a previous sign that was identical. We tried to match the same thing unbeknownst to us that that was not a permitted way to go about it, but I basically went out and did exactly what was done before. Right. And that sign was up for three or four years, so. Um, anyway, we want to get past this and, you know, be able to sure. run our business and be part of the community. So. Well, um, yeah, and I, I, we, we have that same goal for you. Um, you heard some discussion about the master sign program that pre-existed. Right. Um, do you have any thoughts about you whether know, you want to abandon that uh, and just... I, I would say abandoning it just because every, the, the, the city is so different in all the signs. And in fact, I listened to the minutes from the last time, and I think there was some discussion about maybe get, you know, moving away from the master sign program. And I think that would make sense here. So. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Anyone else wish to address the Commission on this item? Seeing none, I'm going to bring it back to the Commissioners for discussion uh, and action. Um, who would like to begin? Anyone? Should I call on? <laughs> well, I, I don't have any problem with them having the two signs um, as long as it conforms to the size of the 27 inches, or I think that's what it was, by 8 feet. And um, I'm sitting here thinking about the advantages and disadvantage of having a master sign program. And I really can't see a huge advantage to keeping one um, for, you know, when there are only two businesses there. Makes a lot of sense, like in King's Plaza or those kinds of places. So signs can be replaced. But I think the village is so sensitive, it might be a good policy to get rid of that master sign program as part of approving these two signs. Okay. Any any other discussions? Uh, I would comments? just say I concur with that. And um, being one of the people who had an issue with the stark white background, um, I appreciate the explanation that was given about why it is. And I really appreciate the the outer white border being removed. Um, it does it does um, address that concern. So with that, I could uh, with if there's more discussion, I could make a motion to approve it. To accept staff recommendation um, with the addition that the master sign program be terminated. Okay. Correct. Is that the motion? Yes. Okay. So uh, I have a few comments but first. Ed, before, uh, let me see if there's a second to the motion. And I'll second it. For okay. Discussion. So there's a second for discussion purposes. So the sign itself and the two signs, I don't have a problem with. It's better. It's not great in my opinion, but it's better. I. I'm a little concerned about uh, how we're handling this master sign program, which I thought was kind of weird in the first place for this building, but yet it's the, bu that's the building owner's property, that master sign program, not this particular applicant's. And I, I don't think it's appropriate for us to take action on the owner's master sign rights without some kind of notice and opportunity for the owner to address that issue of the property okay so if we're if if we're going to go forward with doing the two signs we'll just make a finding that you know even though it's an exception to the master sign program the uh, came to the Planning Commission and the Planning Commission made a determination for this business they could have the second sign mm -hmm. Yeah, we can make that finding. Um, can we also have clarity on the motion? Because uh, Commissioner Westman originally s stated 27 inches for the height, uh, and the staff it, recommendation was 24. Yeah, 24. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you. So, so I, I, I uh, kind of I concur with uh, the rest of the group here. I don't know that I have a huge heartburn doing something with the master plan. Uh, I think the uh, <clears throat> business owner obviously has the ability to, with only two tenants, determine what they want to do there. But um, since it's only one in the village, I don't have a lot of heartburn with it going either way. Um, I, I always also am not a huge fan of the stark white or the white background, but I think uh, not only does it necessarily fit in, but I think it almost does you a disservice. It's really hard, and maybe it's my age, but to read the uh, read those letters from a distance. But Whereas you notice the Armida Winery really stands out um, pronounced. But um, with that, I, I can move with the rest of the commission here. All right, thank you. Okay. Linda, good. Where are we on our motion? Do we need to amend it? Can we break it into two if you still want to do away with the master sign or eliminate that? Or No, I just have a question of staff first. Um, the, the master sign program, because it's the only one that's down there, has been confusing. What would the process be for the owner to remove it if um, they were amenable to doing that? I think it would be essentially a, an amendment to the master sign program where we would come in and ask for it to be removed. Um, originally, that you know, this got noticed as an amendment to the master sign program and then continued. Um, so it, it could be, it, in my mind, it would be appropriate this evening to amend the actual master sign program to allow a 24-inch high by 96-inch wide sign, one on the front, 
and one on the side, and we would just simply update the master sign program, and future applicants wouldn't be confused by different size signs up on the building versus what's allowed under the master sign program. So it was noticed for a master sign program, and that would also be, I think, a more almost a more appropriate alternative so that we don't have conflicting documents in the record. So I would amend my motion then to amend the master sign program rather than um, void it. But I think it's confusing and we're approving something that doesn't meet it, so I think to leave it without saying anything would be problematic. Okay, so there's, uh, an, uh, the maker has made an amendment to the motion. Does That's acceptable to, to the second. So uh, to restate, the motion is to approve staff recommendation, uh, but also amend the master sign program to incorporate um, the well, two sides adjacent street provision and the uh, and the size Updated on the Jason Street. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I, I, and I, I mean, just I'll, I support that motion, but I, I didn't have any uh, concerns about um, the the notice uh, to the applicant. You know, this is our second meeting where we've discussed this item, um, and since the applicant has chosen to come in not under the master sign program, but under our our ordinance, um, and and for their own benefit, I viewed that you know they've in essence waived the master sign program, um, and um, um, and I and again and I think it's overkill and it is confusion to have these two standards uh, and on such a small um, you know uh, commercial building. So uh, those are the reasons why I felt it was appropriate to take action on that. But with that, um, if there are no other discussions, I'll um, call the question. Um, and all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously, Jackie. Um, congratulations, it's been approved. Welcome to Capitola, um, and may you thrive and, and, uh, and um, with that, we'll move on to the next item, which is item B on tonight's agenda, and this is concerning 205 Magellan Street. This is a design ferment for a first and second story addition, which includes a variance request for the 80% permissible structural alteration limit for non conforming structures for an existing single story, single family home located in the R1, that single family residential zoning district. Um, and we will begin with staff presentation. Thank you. Uh, the applicant for this project is applying for a design permit, as you mentioned, to add 1,366 square feet of first and second story additions to the existing non-conforming single-family residence. Uh, the application includes a request for the variance for 80% permissible structural alteration limit for non-conforming structures. The project includes the conversion of the existing garage into a master bedroom and a major interior remodel, as you can see on the plans here. The proposed additions include a new two-car garage in front of the old one, a uh, second story, and a new covered porch on the front, indicated in the blue blocks. So a quick picture of the existing one-story residence. And these are the elevations that have, are being proposed. The proposed roof will have multiple gable ends on the first and second story one with a gable window and one with a gable vent on the front elevation and one with a gable window and one with a gable vent on the rear elevation. Uh, those design elements were uh, complemented by uh, architect Fanton at the Arkansas site committee, just so you know. Applicant is proposing board and batten siding on the first and second story of the new structure. Project is non-conforming because 21 feet of the existing garage encroach approximately 13 inches into the side setback. Based on that non-conformity, the project is subject to Capitola Municipal Code section 17.72.070 for permissible structural alterations. Uh, that section states that if the cost of the total work of the improvements involved exceeds 80% of the present fair market value of the structure as computed by a formula that we have, uh, then the proposed structural alterations may not be made. For the proposed project, the proposed structural changes are 99.5% of the value of the existing structure, 
Therefore, the applicant is requesting variance for the 80% permissible structural alteration limit for non-conforming structures. Uh, the Capitolian Municipal Code states, and I know I've said this multiple times, but I feel like each new batch of people in the audience probably need to hear it, that the Planning Commission may grant a variance permit when it finds that one, because of special circumstances applicable to the subject property, including size, shape, topography, location, or surroundings, the strict application of this title is found to deprive subject property of privileges enjoyed by other properties in the vicinity and under identical zoning classification, and two, that the grant of a variance permit would not constitute a grant of special privilege inconsistent with the limitations upon other properties in the vicinity and zone in which the subject property is situated. So for reference here, the, the parcels on Magellan Street are large by Capitola standards, with most of them being 6,000 square feet or greater. I think most residents of Capitola would love to have 6,000 square feet. <laughs> Of the single family homes located on Magellan Street, all of which require between six and seven foot side yard setbacks, all appear to be non-conforming due to a portion of the home being located within the setback area. This is a result of the design standards being different at the time the structures were constructed. There are not special circumstances applicable to the lot. However, an existing non-conforming encroachment in the side yard is a privilege enjoyed by other properties in the vicinity and under identical zoning classification. The grant of a variance permit would not constitute a grant of special privilege inconsistent with the limitations upon other properties in the vicinity and zone in which the pro subject property is situated because many properties along Magellan Street have non-conforming side yard setbacks. Also of note is that a variance, variance to allow a new encroachment into a side yard setback was approved for 129 Cabrillo Street, which is in the same neighborhood, in 1986 based on the fact that it would not constitute a grant of special privilege inconsistent I'm not going to read the rest of that. You've heard it like four times right now. Uh, in that case, the Planning Commission allowed an addition to be built into the required setback. In this application, however, the applicant is only asking for a variance to exceed the permissible structural alteration limit and keep the nonconforming garage wall in its current location, 4 feet 11 inches from this property line. The proposed additions conform to all of the required setbacks and the structure stays under the maximum floor area ratio for the parcel under the existing code. Staff recommends the Planning Commission review this application and approve project number 18-0184 based on the conditions and findings for approval. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there questions from commissioners on the staff report? Question for staff. Mm -hmm. um, just point of clarification, the garage that exists today is not being demolished and rebuilt. It's going to stay where it is. Okay. Correct. Just wanted to clarify that. Other members of the public that would like to address the commission on this project, please step up. Hi, I'm Robin Alliga, and I'm just here if you have any questions. We took a lot of time and effort doing the design of this to try and meet all the ramifications, all the you know parameters, and then also. Um, you know, address the neighbor privacy by making all the windows higher on the side where we went two stories so that they're all, you know, about here uh, on the from the, they're about four or nine from the floor so that there's not it's just for light and ventilation more than view. Mm -hmm. And so, if, there, if you have any questions, we're here to answer those. Okay, other questions from commissioners for Robin? I just have one quick question. Um, did you have a neighborhood meeting where you showed the plans to the neighbors and reviewed that with yes. them? Yes, you know what, I'll actually let the owner, he has letters from all the neighbors. Um, do you want to stand up? Or, um, sure. Yeah. Is that okay? If you... Hello, my name is Scott Harway. I'm the homeowner along with my wife, Minnie Harway. Um, we've been designing our hopefully future home for uh, several years. Um, and we've incorporated all of our immediate neighbors into the, um, into the, not only the process, but our finished product as well. Um, we've gotten input from all of them. They've all approved it. I have letters here. Um, I believe some of them have even been mailed to you guys as far as letters of support from all of our immediate neighbors, the homeowners that live in the area, um, that, uh, that they um, are all in favor of our design moving forward um, and approve of it. And, uh, 
Uh, yes, and, and the renter directly uh, next door that's been there for over 10 years, um, also them as well. So everybody, all of our immediate neighbors um, that their, their properties touch ours or have a direct view of ours have all been involved in the process and have all um, also submitted uh, letters of support for us. I would just like to commend um, you for having done that. When I was reading a lot of the letters, it became apparent to me that you had shared the plans with the neighborhood, and that's not often done. Um, but I really commend you for doing that. Thank you. I feel, uh, if I could just say on that, Magellan Street and probably Cliffwood Heights as a whole, but Magellan Street reminds me a lot of a street where I grew up on where every, I mean, I, we can go around, I can tell you every single person that lives up and down our street. Sometimes they probably know a little too much about our business or <laughs> ask them, but um, it's a very tight knit community and uh, I would never want to move forward with something um, this grandiose that could have, have an effect on the community without getting their involvement and approval prior to. Thank you. Any other well, questions that you have for me? I don't believe that any nope. other questions. Um, but I, I as well want to thank you for uh, making this a neighborhood uh, project, sharing the information with everyone, and also particularly addressing the privacy issues uh, that had come up. So. I'm Beverly Motter, a retired school teacher with Pajaro Valley Unified School District. In 1965, when my family and I moved from the San Joaquin Valley area where I had been born and raised, we first found a rental in Scotts Valley. When, that, when the owner suddenly sold out from under us, we luckily found our home at 146 Sir Francis Court in Capitola. which Gary Meeker, the original owner, was selling. He now lives across the street from us. Since the homes on Magellan behind us are graded at least four feet higher than ours, we decided that we needed a, a fence that would protect our privacy. And David Tashikian was the owner at that time. Uh, he agreed that privacy for both families was needed and a tall fence was erected. When the family on my right applied for a second story, Mr. Tashikian was adamant against it and our invasion of privacy. The council gave it a go ahead with a pr provision that windows on the side and back be above six feet so that our privacy would be protected. I'm asking for the same provisions. Please let me keep my privacy. Thank you, Ms. Mater, for coming in. Can we see the map again, which showed the houses so mm -hmm. we can see? Oh, whoops, sorry. So you live on the street, can, can I? Sure, I live ahead. in the court. So where the uh, sort of? Sir Francis Court. Okay. My backyard is his backyard. Okay. Their backyard. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there 50 years or more. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. I'll just point out, See, since we're talking about uh, the rear yard here that backs up to that, um, the rear yard setback, the required is 20 feet, and it's at 32 feet in this um, proposed project. Right. So. And, and could you show us again then where the height of the windows? Um, mm -hmm. and I can't tell from the face. Right there. So can, can we, because I do have a concern about some privacy issues. Do we want to just mm -hmm. talk about them now? Um, let's finish the public. Uh, yeah, why don't, the yeah, why don't we finish this and then we'll bring it all back. But um, I did maybe want to see if we could get in information about uh, the existing project design um, and see if it, um, you know, uh, already addresses Ms. Mader concerns um, or whether we could work with the applicant to, uh, you know, adjust it in any way. 
Uh, but maybe we could show us, you know, where those windows are and the height of them. So I'm assuming she's referring to actually the door and the balcony on the second floor, because that's what faces the rear of the lot. The west elevation? Yes. Sorry, I can't read the writing. Yes, it's actually my concern. The, the actual windows that were changed in terms of privacy are the ones on the upper left, the south elevation. As you can see, those are the high, high windows that the uh, architect or designer was referring to. Yes. And I just have one question for uh, y your address, ma'am. 146. Sir oh, 146. Francis okay, Ford. thank you. Now, Ms. May, are you able to see on this drawing on the top left side where it says south elevation? You know what? Thank you. No, that's fine. I, I don't think her backyard backs up to. I don't either. Yes, my backyard's right. Literally. No, I, I think you're actually a few houses down. Uh, if you look Pardon? on them, you're actually a few houses down from their backyard. No, no, no. My backyard and their backyard are. Okay. They're right, right over well, the uh, fence from me. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, I'll we're, bring we're pulling it out. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, sorry. This here is 146 Sir Francis Court. I'm 146. Okay, that's this property here. Two oh five is um, there's quite a separation yeah. between the two. So two oh five Magellan is up the street approximately about six homes. So it does not directly back up. It's about six homes up. So you're some distance away from this project. Pardon? You're some dis your home is some distance away. From no, this right project, well, um, well, with the address that you gave us, one four six, that's what staff has pulled up on the map, and and that where the arrow is, what she's showing, that's your your home there, one four six, and the project you see is at the top of the screen. It's really hard to see on that map. Yeah. It's hard to, it's very hard. yeah. Okay. So, but it's about seven seven properties up. There you go. There's a. Yeah. Sir Francis Court, I'm right here. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, it's a good night. Well, no worries. Go you know. Ahead. It's really, <laughs> see, it just goes to show it was good that you came here mm -hmm. to get that confirmed and, and to express your oh, <laughs> congratulations. That's it. Um, I think with that, um, I will bring this back to the commission for further discussion uh, and action. Um, is Ed? You, you yeah, know? let me start because I kind of feel the energy of this application. <laughs> so I'll get my uh, dissent in here right away. And then <laughs> Yeah, I mean, everything about this uh, project is a, a positive, uh, except one thing, which is the variance request. A and the problem with it is, is that you have to show special circumstances to be entitled to a variance under uh, the government code. It doesn't matter that everybody else in the neighborhood or the rest of the world uh, has whatever it is you're asking for. There, it has to be the shape uh, topography, one of the elements, and it just, I mean, the, the staff report says there are no special circumstances here, so uh, we would be uh, conflicting with 
the government code if we approved a variance without special circumstances. So uh, to me, there are only two options here. One is either to, and I, I mean, I'm sorry because it's only 13 inches, I know, to either comply and then the project is an absolute go because it meets every single requirement and it's a great project. Or to somehow meet the 80% rule so a variance isn't required. So I'm not going to be able to support the variance unless I hear some awfully compelling arguments from somebody. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Ed, for that. Um, anyone else? Well, I'll jump in there. Um, I, I'm not going to be able to convince a uh, an attorney that has a background in real estate, obviously, but um, I think what we have seen is in um, Capitola, especially in these type of circumstances where uh, we have all these non-conforming buildings today because we've changed our code throughout the time, and now the setbacks have changed. Um, in this case, they're not, uh, as far as I'm concerned, they're not adding to that um, setback problem. and. Um, I think we've set a, a precedence throughout Capitola in general. One, it's a very, it's one of the reasons I think we got rid of the 80% um, code in, in our new zoning code. We got rid of this 80% standard because it just draws so much um, difficulty in trying to decide some of these things. But for the variance as far as um, the setback, I, I, quite frankly, I think we've set enough precedence throughout the rest of the city. And who do you, who do you, pick to be that person and say, okay, from here on out, we're not going to do that. So um, I know I'm not convincing you, Ed, but um, I, I, I kind of lean the other way. I think this is something that we've allowed for many, many years. We've changed our code several times and um, our setbacks have changed several times. So for me, I don't, I don't have a real issue. I think uh, it's acceptable. All right. Thank you, TJ. So I have, an, I have another issue with the application. Um, uh, you probably can convince me to go along with it, with the variance, but what I can't go along with is the second floor rear yard deck. And uh, even if the um, you know existing neighbors say it's fine, uh, we've found over and over again that those create problems <coughs> and they really are an intrusion into people's uh, privacy. And on this particular application, it's, it's sort of one big room. Uh, they could easily put the uh, balcony on the front side of the house, and it would be in the same room if they, uh, it, was, it was extremely important to them to have a balcony. But um, I, I just find that, you know, um, I, I can't go along with approving a house, uh, a second floor addition with a rear yard balcony. I just think it's... Um, ultimately becomes a privacy problem for the neighbors. So that would be uh, the one thing I would need to see changed on the application if I was going to vote for it. Okay. Thank you, Susan. Linda? Well, I'm going to be a fly in the ointment, I think, because um, I agree with what TJ says about the, the variance, and I think by the time this project comes to fruition, the 80% um, rule will be gone and the new code will be um, in effect. So you, if you waited a year, then that would go away and, and I don't see any reason to have to wait for that. The back deck doesn't bother me that much because of the distance between um, where that deck ends and where the the backyards are. I know where I live, it's very, very tight and it makes it really bad to have second floor rear decks because you're just looking right down in everybody's backyard. But when I looked at this, I was thinking that the distance would be far enough um, to alleviate that as an issue. But I would ask the, the question of the applicant if they would be willing to um, forego the, the upstairs back deck and have a just large windows that opened, would that be acceptable? Do we ask the would, chair, would it be appropriate to ask the, do we ask the applicant that? Sure. If, uh, if Scott, if you're prepared to come up and answer that question. Before that he answers be. that, though, Susan, would you be, would it make a difference to you if it weren't a deck, but would, were just 
you know, big windows if, that if, open? If, if it's windows, uh, I'm comfortable with it. You know, they have fairly large windows in the front. They could match uh, the windows that are on the front. If I could just address the reasoning of the deck first, if that's a possibility. Um, we uh, believe the lady that left um, kind of talked about it, where the people behind us, there's a, a lower um, elevation on Sir Francis and Wesley and Eleanor behind us. We have amazing sunset views that happen behind our house. And it's not, it's a very small deck that we have up there. It's not an entertaining deck. And the idea was actually brought forth by our neighbors that have a two-story deck on their house directly across the street down at the corner. There's three two-story decks on Magellan Street alone. Um, so it wasn't a deck that we meant to have entertainment. It's a smaller one that's actually built directly by a 30-plus uh, foot tall palm tree that blocks our view from our neighboring properties and we can only look back and behind us we can only see rooftops we can't see down into anyone's property and we also have 30 Two. some odd 32 feet from the rear of the structure i'm sorry from the rear of our property anyways also behind our property is a wall of bamboo so, that goes so from the side question to side. that we had was would you be willing to get rid of the deck um it, it's definitely something we'd, we'd be open to. I mean, if that's our only option, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Scott. I, I would just, here's, here's my concern about this, is um, what is the difference from looking out a window into the same area as looking from a deck? And, I, and we've had this discussion several times about entertainment, and um, I think we addressed that. This deck is a very shallow deck. It's not one made to uh, barbecue and cook from. So. I, I don't I don't share that same concern. I think it adds a luxury. I don't think it's someone that I mean I, I understand privacy and we're get, we're in an area that's it's going to be the common discussion uh, for quite a while. But in this situation, the height of the um, I'm a little bit familiar with it because my cousin I mean my uncle lived on Eleanor right behind, and the, it's so high uh, from the Eleanor side to them you can't see. Uh, out your back window except for a fence and for the people on the jail and they're looking way over the top of it so I don't see it as a privacy issue but even given that with large windows you see the same viewing area uh, the only question would be is are you going to party out on the deck I guess would be the question so how deep is the deck the, the yeah. staff know how deep the deck is four feet four feet four feet, four feet. yeah it's, it's very shallow yeah, yeah. You know, I think that um, we've seen more and more that, you know, privacy is an issue. You know, I appreciate that maybe they're only going to stand there and look at sunsets. We know homes don't stay in the same ownership forever. We know neighbors don't stay the same. And for me, it's a bad precedent to have the second floor rear deck. I think we have talked about not allowing them um, in the future. And so, um, uh, I, I can't. I can't see approving it with the deck on Kay. this particular one. Yeah, thank you, but Susan. But there may be three of you. So, so can I respond? Just comment on Commissioner Smith's uh, point about the new ordinance. I took a look at that, and I'm not really sure uh, how that would play out. We haven't really uh, implemented that ordinance yet, and I tried to look at it in terms of uh, the. Uh, variance request or the nonconformity on this particular project, and it wasn't at all clear to me that they would qualify under the new ordinance either. Okay. And uh, okay. Yeah, I, I agree with your interpretation. I looked at that too. The issue here is is that when the city council <coughs> change, changes a rule for a neighborhood, and so all the houses that existed prior to the change of that rule follow a certain set of rules. Now, if the, if the new houses or new lots that are under the new set of rules uh, get variances because everyone else is under the old set of rules, then the City Council's act was really meaningless. I mean, you're basically saying they can either have the new rules or they can have the old rules because everyone else has them. Well, I, I, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that because under a new construction, absolutely, it would have to meet the new setbacks. But when you're looking at an existing home that you're adding to and again, it goes back to this 80%. Are we, what are we doing with that 80%? I understand that. But um, to have an expectation that they have to move the whole house over a few inches because we changed the codes after that current house, 
uh, it just doesn't seem logical. They don't have to move the whole house. They just have to take one one <laughs> garage wall. Yeah, understood. Inches. Understood. And uh, I mean, I like the project. I'm happy if you guys approve it, and I can stick to my uh, understanding of. Okay. <laughs> well, um, maybe um, I'll weigh in on both of those questions. One uh, first about the variance, and then about the rear deck. Um, um, you know, one, one concerning the variance, and yes, it is a directive from the City Council, um, but in my reading of Section 1772.070, um, it in essence says that the cost shall not exceed 80 percent of the present fair market value of the structure. It doesn't say 80 percent of the cost of the reconstruction. So the Council said what it meant to say. And I'm not sure if the calculations that we use are in strict compliance with that ordinance. And so that's why, I mean, if it were clear and if it were direct, I, 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 could, I could maybe see um, where you're going with this, Ed, um, and apply that. But the way the calculations are used, it compares cost of uh, construction against cost of construction, not fair market value. I'm not sure if that is an, a um, correct application, and particularly in situations where um, the difference is de minimis and the cost of compliance is great. Um, and so when I weigh those in, um, and I do view, I, I believe that there are special circumstances uh, from um, the the um, non-conforming nature of that neighborhood, almost every, this is, um, um, you know, uh, created, you know, by changing rules w in which the homeowners, you know, have no um, responsibility uh, for, uh, in, uh, for doing. Um, and when you have a project that ultimately, for the most part, complies, uh, but for, um, you know, a small, um, you know, setback, um, which is pre-existing and is not being altered or, or changed, I think that it is within our purview to uh, uh, grant that variance. And I think there are sufficient uh, circumstances in this situation, taking uh, everything as a whole, to um, have the appropriate findings. But I'm mostly concerned about how we apply this um, and it would seem to me that if we consistently do this, it's, we're going to confront many homeowners with the economic inability uh, to make these significant upgrades. Because of the, I think the improvements, I mean, if you look at the end game, the improvements are a betterment to the neighborhood. It's a in betterment to, uh, you know, the look of our community and keeping up, um, um, you know, maintenance and reconstruction and, uh, and the needs of, of modern families. And so uh, when I look at it from that perspective, um, I'm okay with granting the variance. On the rear deck, um, all, because it's uh, only four feet in width, um, it's, there's 34 feet setback, rear yard setback, it's, which is way beyond what is normally required. I think that uh, the applicant has shown some responsibility toward their rear neighbors. Um, and I think I kind of agree with TJ. What's the difference between a deck and a window? Um, <coughs> and so I think it just creates a little bit more usability for the owners. Uh, I don't see, there's nothing in the record here right now for this project about privacy issues. And, and I know that you've experienced, Susan, in other areas, but. I, I think that we should look at projects on a case-by-case -case basis and see if there's, uh, if there were a neighbor here saying, oh my God, this is too close, I'm right behind you, and they got that rear deck, uh, which we almost had, but um, there isn't one. And so that, that um, I think, uh, weighs into my decision. Um, so I would be willing to, um, you know, uh, accept staff recommendation, uh, approve the project with the variance, but with that, it sounds like we maybe have a Well, know, I'll, I'll just jump out there and make a motion that we um, 
uh, accept staff recommendation to approve as um, outlined. And um, I wish I would have articulated my discussion as well as you were, but uh, I think we're on the same page. So I would move a motion that um, we uh, approve the project as outlined by staff. Is there a second? I would second it with a possible friendly amendment if you would consider it, and that is um, condition it that the second floor deck can never be extended past the four feet depth. I, I'm good with that. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Roll, roll call vote, please. Okay, uh, Jackie, let's have a roll call vote. Commissioner Newman? No. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Welch? Yes. Commissioner Westman? No. Chairperson Story? Yes. The motion passes three to two, which will bring us to our next item, item C. Uh, congratulations. Um, item C has been deleted from tonight's agenda, so we'll move on to item D, which is uh, a project at 210 uh, Central Avenue. Um, this is uh, an application for a design permit, conditional use permit, major uh, revocable encroachment permit, and variance requests to the 80% permissible structural alteration limit for non conforming structures for an addition to an historical single family residence at 210 Central Avenue within the R1 single family zoning district. We'll have a staff presentation, please. Okay, thank you, Chairperson Story, and good evening, commissioners. Before you is an application at 210 Central Avenue. This is in the Depot Hill neighborhood and in an area of, uh, there's quite a few historic homes along the first two to three streets along um, Depot Hill. So, um, I'm going to give you an overview of the project. It, the, this slide is showing the existing home in red at the bottom and the area of the existing home to be removed in blue. So the first story of this home is actually decreasing in size of square footage with the um, extended portion of the, the building that extends all the way to the rear property line. It's a series of, there's some sheds in there as well as um, just informal additions that took place over time. The applicant is proposing to keep the front cottage of the home and then they'll have the new addition directly behind that. The setback standard in the um, R1 district is a 20% um, of the lot depth, not to exceed 25 feet. And this proposal is at 31 feet from the rear lot line. So they've really brought the, the, the home is um, located just short of the 15 foot front yard setback and the new addition is um, has been brought close to the home in an effort to maintain the rear yard and provide um, its similar lineup to the neighboring properties so as you can see in this slide um, the required setbacks are within the dashed line the existing home is um, over the property line and as you we just went through a thorough discussion on when you've got a property that extends over the existing properties it's a non-conforming structure and so the historic home here is non-conforming the new addition does comply with all the setback requirements for the first and second story um, now I'll go through the elevations and the proposed design um, the the existing elevation is on the left for the front and the proposed elevation is on the right. It, this is a two-dimensional design, so it's hard to see the stepping that occurs, but from the front facade of this building to the uh, new addition behind it, there's 20 feet. And um, in this image, you can see it a little bit better. This is the north elevation, and from the front of the historic building to the new addition, is a, there's a 20-foot setback. Um, and you can see the new addition is a two-story element. It's made up of board and bat, um, complementing the historic home in the front, and it also has accents of stucco. This is the south elevation, so again, you can see um, how it steps up in the back, again, using materials of board and bat and stucco. And sorry, on this previous slide, I also wanted to point out the height. There's um, 
a pyramidal gable roof form on the historic home. So it has a bit of height to it with that roof form. So the difference between the top of the pyramidal roof form and the proposed um, elongated roof is seven feet in difference in height. And this is the difference between the rear elevation. So again, the existing is above and the proposed is below. Um, going through this process, um, when you have a historic home, it's required to go to receive a conditional use permit to show that you've mitigated all impacts to the historic structure. And so step one is to always have it reviewed by an architectural historian. This, the applicant um, had a pre-meeting to, to review the history of this building and um, Leslie Dill created a form that identified all of the character defining issues of this building. From that report, um, the applicant worked on their first draft of the design. The draft you have in front of you this evening is actually a third draft. So Leslie Dill had two rounds of edits that were done during the step, first step of this process. Once uh, Leslie Dill um, found that the proposal was in compliance with the Secretary of Interior Standards, we brought the application to the Architectural and Site Review Committee. Um, during that meeting, there was concern raised by um, the architect on the board, Frank Fanton, as well as our local historian, Carolyn Swift, regarding the massing of the building behind it. Um, following that meeting, um, I reached out to the applicant, and I know they had been through a lot with revisions with Leslie, but we asked for more information. Under the art, uh, design guidelines, it states if, if more information is needed to show mass and scale to the Planning Commission, you can ask for streetscapes and 3D imaging. So at that point, um, requested additional imaging to, so that it would be easier. The, the two-dimensional plans are tricky to read and to see the articulation. So And also, um, the architect, Frank Fanton, asked for them to create within their site plan to show the neighboring buildings and where their window locations are. So this is the additional information that came in after the Arkan site meeting. So in this image, you can see 210 Central in the center. And I've highlighted all the windows, and they're on the first and second stories of the proposed building, um, and highlighted the neighbor's building. Another interesting thing about this image is you can see where um, there's the patio in the backyard, but you can see the two windows that face the rear. The rear of this building does line up with the rear of the neighbor's homes, as you can see in this image. And you can see where the windows line up as well. And there's, again, the 32 feet setback, kind of consistent with the neighboring structures. Here's a 3D image. So on the top right is what the home looks like today. Um, below is the 3D image. So you can start to see the articulation between the historic home and the rear addition. The stucco area is where the staircase comes up, and they've really stepped that back in three pieces. The portion of the building that is um, that's attached to the building, you can see how much narrower it is, and it sits behind, it has a similar pyramid form on top of the roof structure, and it's, it steps in on both sides of the historic building to kind of differentiate old from new and start to define what, you know, where the new addition begins. This is a streetscape, and again, this is in a um, more of a straight on view. So here you can see there's a mix of single family and two story homes along the street. Um, and then another interesting matter that came out of the historic review is that um, during a site visit, Miss Dill found the evidence that she didn't think that the original porch, she thinks it was replaced over time. Um, so you can see the difference of the existing home currently on the right bottom and what's being proposed on the left. So within the new proposal, they are introducing a new style of a front porch that will actually um, tie into that pyramidal roof, but it will change that essential form of that roof. And we had quite a bit of um, public comment that was sent to us stating that they think the, the front porch may be original. And Frank Fanton, I'm sorry, Frank Perry at the museum provided me with the image on top that it's very blurry and I apologize but there's a very clear line of where the um, where the roof 
ends, the pyramidal roof, and where it appears that there was a porch element, but it was not, never tied into that roof above. So th that's new evidence for the Planning Commission this evening of what the format of the front porch most likely looked like, and it's not exactly what's proposed in the project. So uh, you're saying in the photograph, the yes. roof line of the existing building is the same? Yes. It appears to be. You can see, you know, this straight line here, and it appears that the pyramidal roof, there's a straight line here, and then it seems that the porch roof element is here. But it is fuzzy, <laughs> and it's, you know, um, but that that is, that was the best image of three that were sent to me from Frank. Okay. So, <laughs> thank you. Yes. Um, so with that, um, the applicant is asking for a variance to the non-conforming. The cost of the improvements are at 128 percent of the fair market value, um, and so it exceeds the 80 percent. Um, in reviewing a variance, there have to be special circumstances tied to the lot, um, which we've gone over this again and again. The special circumstance that staff is tying to this lot is actually the historic structure within its historic location. It's not exactly a steep slope um, or something very specific to the property itself, but it is um, the way in which it was developed over time, and it's something uh, historic structures hold a high ranking within our general plan and our zoning code for preservation. And then grant of special, a special privilege, it would not be seen as a grant of special privilege because it is consistent with our general plan goals and policies for historic preservation. And there are three examples along this street in which this 80 percent um, a, a variance to the 80% regulation have been granted in the past. The uh, fourth portion of this application is that they're requesting a major revocable encroachment permit. Um, first, I should say there is a little walkway that walk goes across in front of this property. Public Works has no interest in that walkway remaining in its place. It, it, it dead ends on one side of the property. It's not safe for um, ADA access, so they'd prefer not to not to discontinue that walkway. Um, they're requesting a major revocable encroachment permit for the two-foot retaining wall, the steps leading to the property, and also the fence that encroaches out into the right-of-way. So staff recommends that the Planning Commission consider the input of the Architectural and Site Review Committee and the Architectural Historian. And this is a unique circumstance that we have differing opinions. And so, um, we would suggest that you either continue the application with a request for specific modifications to address the Arkan Site Committee's concerns, or approve the project application based on the findings and conditions. So we typically don't give a, a dual recommendation, but in this circumstance, it seemed like the right thing to do. So thank you. That concludes my presentation. Thank you, Katie. Are there questions from commission? I have a question for staff. Yeah. Uh, I have two questions. One. Uh, in Frank's uh, notes about Arkansas originally, he said that, uh, well, his words were um, interesting design. The elevations are, is well art articulated. It didn't say anything about massing. I didn't see that until the follow-up letters. Was Did he originally have massing concerns? It just wasn't noted here, or was that after the fact? So I have to apologize. I was not in attendance at this Arkin site meeting, but from what I understand, he, he had more privacy concerns and wanted to know where the location of the neighboring Yeah, I, I didn't see. I, I did were, read his follow-up letters. Yeah. Uh, the second question I have is, did the applicant and Mrs. Dill have access to the photos that uh, were supplied to you by uh, Frank, the, the photos you showed of the original? I don't believe portion? so. I think that. No. Okay. Thank you. When we have a project with this significant a change in the massing, um, is it um, appropriate to use the orange fencing and show what that massing really looks like? Because there's been differing opinions over it's only seven feet. If you're looking up at it, is it going to look as big as it looks in the drawing or is it not? 
Um, yeah, with a design permit, you have the option of asking for additional material to understand the project. So. If the the Arkansas committee's issue was about the massing of the st additions. Mm -hmm. um, do we have um, ordinances or abilities to uh, dictate uh, lesser massing than uh, what we have currently c concerning floor error ratio as it applies to another? Do we have a separate set of guidelines that apply to historic structures? We, we have the Secretary of Interior standards for historic structures. So, um, in within there's ten guidelines within right. the standards. But Ms. Dill found that it was in compliance with those standards. She did, and right. um, specifically how the new relates to the old and okay. compatibility. Well, seeing that, if we were to defer this to consider or have the applicant consider the arc and site issues. Um, uh, on what standards or basis would we do that? Um, so it is um, a qualitative analysis that you're making instead of quantitative within this whether or not the new addition overwhelms the historic structure. So, and, and that's exactly why we have this situation of you've got Leslie Dill, who is an architect. Um, right by trade and an archi uh, historic architect, more specifically. Um, so she, I think, you know, in her qualitative analysis and understanding of how the building changed over time, um, she found that it's in compliance. But it would be, it's, it's for this committee, it's y you're making that decision of that qualitative analysis. Okay, thank you. Okay. Also, it's a conditional use permit because it's a historic modification, and the, that gives us latitude on that issue. Okay. I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from commissioners on the staff report? Seeing none, I'll open it up to the public. And members of the public would like to address us on this project. Please step forth. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Bridget Esty. Um, I have my. I am one of the homeowners of 210 Central Avenue. I have my husband Paul here and my daughter Allie. Um, we both. My husband and I own 210 Central Avenue. We um, have been residents of Depot Hill since 2003. We do own a home on Escalona Drive as well, and uh, we've been here in Capitola and on the hill for 15 years. We bought this house, uh, the historic uh, house on 210 Central, with the intent to uh, expand, uh, remodel it for the use of our expanding family. Our children are uh, adult age. Our oldest daughter just recently got engaged, and so we're looking forward to uh, our family expanding and uh, having grandchildren and um, having a place for us all to gather here. Uh, my husband and I will be retiring here, and so uh, we will have uh, full-time residence here on Depot Hill. And so this is exactly where we f see our children coming and being with us. So that was the thought in mind when we designed this house. Um, it was to be able to house our family, our growing family, to be able to uh, have us all be together. So recognizing that we uh, also, in our remodel plans, had uh, uh, the obligation to comply to the Secretary um, uh, of um, uh, Interior Standards for Rehabilitation. We uh, uh, started our project by um, uh, reaching out to the planning department and they let us know who we needed to work with to begin the design process. We worked collaboratively with uh, Ms. Dill um, and staff from the planning department and our architect uh, over several months to come up with this design. Um, there was an iterative process. We went back and forth making changes to the design to be in compliance with the uh, with Ms. Dill's recommendations to be compliant to the standard as well as compliance to all of the other uh, cities uh, planning and building ordinance ordinances. And we were very pleased to be able to come up with a design that met both of those, the, the, uh, the, the standard 
uh, compliance for the addition to all the other setbacks and FAR. Um, and it also, uh, the design also meets our family's needs. Um, we were able to uh, uh, have a backyard for um, our growing family, a uh, front yard for a growing family. Um, and so, uh, and we also, uh, in the, uh, that iterative process, um, uh, took into consideration the privacy of our, our neighbors at 208 and 212. Um, uh, uh, there are, uh, uh, you know, the, the window placement and uh, in addition to the structures that are already there, both fences and um, uh, trees and um, large hedges, uh, we believe all in combination address those privacy issues. We're excited to remodel this house. It's in great need of remodeling um, and improve this home. And uh, we're looking forward to getting to know our, our Central Avenue neighbors. Um, and we're thrilled uh, to be able to um, call 210 Central our home for our expanding family. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Hi, I'm Bob Bowles. I'm uh, the SD's architect, and uh, I can answer any more technical questions you might have. I just wanted to talk a little bit about the site planning. Um, there was no way to give the SD's the program they wanted with uh, nice outdoor spaces at the front and the back without making it a two-story high house. Um, if we had made it all one story, there would have been virtually no yard, yard left over. Um, the second story is well set back from the sides. It's very well set back from the front of the house, from the front of the property, and it's very well set back from the rear. There are some windows on the side of the second floor, but they look out onto roofs and onto vegetation. Um, there is no deck. <laughs> um, so the, the, sec the, the house sits in virtually the same footprint that the existing house sits in. Um, except that it's been pulled back at the rear and uh, some extraneous uh, sheds and so forth have been re, uh, um, taken out. Um, there's um, a photograph that we had submitted that didn't show up on the presentation. Um, if I could show that to you. Um, I didn't realize it wasn't in the presentation or I would have brought extra copies. Maybe if you could give it to Matt and they, could you? It, it's in the staff report too. It was in our staff report. Yeah. Oh, it was? Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. It's in the packet. It just wasn't up on the Yeah, screen. okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, this, this shows what you see from the street. The street is several feet lower than the house. So the additions being far back and hidden behind the very tall roof of the historic building, you hardly see them from the street, at least if you're looking straight on. Um, 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 I think we've done a good job with uh, the new materials on the addition. They're sympathetic without copying the historic structure. We're not actually allowed to do that per the Secretary of the Interior Standards. I think the, um, it's a nice design. It'll be a very comfortable family home for the Estes. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. I have Thank one, you. Yeah, one question about the, the porch. Um, given the, the new evidence of the photographs, is there a, a, a problem changing that front porch design to what it is now instead of having it fit into the roof? Um, first of all, it's the first time we've ever seen that photograph, either, either us or the Estes. Um, we believe, and I think uh, Leslie Dill, the historic architect, believes that uh, the porch is not historic, but that it is in the same location as whatever was there originally. Um, there's evidence from the Sanborn maps that shows shows that. Um, we did our best to recreate what we thought might have been there originally. Um, I don't think the Estes would have a problem with a revised design. Uh, what is on the on the plans is a, is a new porch, a new design, so um, we could probably lower it and disengage it from the, the front of the historic part of the building. Thank you. But I haven't had a chance to talk to them about that, so. All right. <laughs> Does anyone else 
want to address the commission, please come up. Yeah. Go. Hi, my name is John Ruder, and my wife and I, Val, we live next door at 212 Central Avenue. We're the homeowners. We are certainly not opposed to improving 210. It, it is old. It needs some improvement. But to be candid, we are very concerned about the, the massive addition. We feel it is not keeping uh, with the tenor of Depot Hill even a little bit. I think you saw the elevation where they showed the four houses. I, I don't agree with the architect's contention that if you're standing in the street and looking up, you're not going to see this ginormous addition. I mean, it's, it's a cute little, I mean, it's old, it, it's crummy, it needs some uh, renovation, but there's this little uh, bit in the, back, in the front, and then the addition is massive. Now, our, our challenge is that since we're next door and we're to the north, that this house is going to cut up our sun in our backyard. So uh, we got the house five years ago, and it was red tagged. So we spent 200 grand fixing the house, internally 100 grand, externally 100 grand, but in compliance with city code. It, we didn't want to try to make a Silicon Valley McMansion. There's plenty of those in Silicon Valley. We believe that we like this area because it's unique and distinctive. Recreating Silicon Valley in Depot Hill does not seem appropriate. Our, again, we are absolutely supportive of improvement. A single story would absolutely work. We have a hot tub in the backyard, while there's the windows would frankly look into our hot tub. But our primary concern is that it's going to wipe out the 100 grand that we spent on the backyard uh, because the sun will be, will be, especially in the winter, will be uh, obscured by the house. And if I could, it sound, when we looked at the staff report, it seemed that there was a couple points which didn't seem to come out. Uh, we actually approached Carolyn Swift and Frank Fenton directly, and they shared some written comments. I can share these with you later, but I can read some of uh, Frank Fenton's comments. I am now having some serious doubts about this project. Uh, during the Arkansas site meeting, I went before Carolyn, so I didn't realize the historian had recommended the addition be subservient to the existing. Um, my vote for this project has gone from an unenthusiastic yes to a vehement no. I, I can share the email with you. We, uh, we, we have it. it. Okay, oh, great. And then separately, uh, Carolyn Swift, the, the local historian, not the, the state person, had indicated that she felt that the addition was way, way, way too big. It did not create something in tenor uh, with the neighborhood. She acknowledges that Leslie Dill is very competent, great to work with, and that it technically meets the requirements of the state but is not in keeping tenor with the, with the whole area. And separately, on a practical matter, the, the, the bit in the front, that's the original bit. The addition that you saw in blue, uh, some of that is, is dirt floors with carpet. So I, I acknowledge that it is possible just to build lean-tos on the back of a house and then say, I want 80% of that, but it seems unreasonable to incorporate that into the existing value of the home. Otherwise, everyone could just add some dirt, a lean-to, and voila. Big Mansion. Thank you for your attention consideration. Yeah, thank you. Does anyone else would like to address the commission? Good evening. Uh, I'm Alberto Munoz. I live in 700 Escalona. Um, I've known the Estes for a really, really long time. And through that time, I've seen them do uh, a few renovations through these years. And the renovations have always been very consistent with the neighborhood. They have never been excessive. And the outcome has been amazing. As a matter of fact, you can probably see their house in, in Escalona uh, as, as, a, as, as a, a proof of that. Now, uh, I believe that this, this type of work is good for the neighborhood. It will improve property uh, taxes or income for, for the city. Uh, it will also increase property values. And if you look at the pictures and you look at uh, what this house will look like, it's, it's a tremendous improvement uh, over what is there now. And you also have to consider that they have spent significant amount of effort and money uh, maintaining the historic nature of that, of that property. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Anyone else like to address the commission tonight? Seeing none, I'm going to uh, close the uh, public portion of the meeting and bring it back.
to the commissioners for discussion and action. Okay, I'll jump in there. Go for it, TJ. Uh, a couple things here. Um, one is uh, we've had this concern before, and uh, this this um, project really has me concerned about it. But it has to do with our Arkansas site, and we we re when we reviewed in our zoning code about what we do with Arkansas site, we decided to keep it. But we have to make one thing clear: Carolyn Swift is a great historian for the city. She's not an architect. She's not a construction. She's not a builder. She she is just what she is as a historian for the city. Um, her talking about masking is like me talking about landscaping, I guess. So, I, and I get her concern because it is a concern. Um, Frank Fanton's change of heart, um, originally he said that uh, he liked the, um, the layout, changed uh, notably, and I, I assume maybe after uh, some of the neighbors talked to him, uh, according, because we have two different letters, one that came from Frank uh, and then, then the email that was forwarded to it this evening. And I'd just like to address that because um, I get I get the concern by the neighbors. Absolutely get the concern. I have the same issues, uh, concern about uh, sunlight, in my property, and and neighbors looking in my backyard. But uh, this is the area we live in, in a very uh, s small area, and we just talked about privacy in the project before. But uh, you know, he he brought up uh, Frank brought up in his letter about uh, 124. Um, now being this Mickey Mouse type thing. But uh, interesting, I, I went and I looked at November 6, 2014, his statements about, um, I call it the Google House, I don't know, but it's, it's a 124, which is a very large, very large uh, project on Central, the same street. And Frank had to say there that he reviewed the application, expressed that the design does a good job of differenti d differentiating uh, new from historic, he noted the addition and how it's attached to the building will not be visible from the street. So he goes from that when, uh, during the Arkansas site meeting to this letter after the neighbors contacted him saying that it's a Mickey Mouse house. And then he changes uh, his statement from his Arkansas site meeting with these other letters that uh, I, I understand his concern, I understand the neighbor's concern. Uh, I think Arkansas site is, is there for a very specific reason. I think we as a group, and when we looked at the zoning, wanted to keep them there, but also try to keep it consistent with city staff people who could stay, uh, I guess, focused on their areas of concern. And while I, I, I love Carolyn, I think she's um, uh, great for our community, I, I don't <coughs> think she has, uh, uh, I guess the authority really to judge massing in the street. And that's why we have uh, the occupants, applicants, pay for Jan Dill because it, it's a cost, it's an expense to have to go through this historic person. So this is a person who has um, the credentials and the background in studying to, to look at that. And I think that's um, where I go to look to see what Jan has. And it sounds like, um, I'm sorry, uh, Leslie, <coughs> has said, and it sounds like they've, they've followed those guidelines, uh, I'm a little bit miffed by the, uh, you know, the late um, notice of these pictures that the, that porch structure was there, but um, I, I, I would guess that um, the applicant and um, Miss uh, Deal would, you know, probably go along with changing to look how it was supposed to look in those days. The other thing I want to address is, uh, in one of the letters, it talks about um, the uh, Estes having uh, some con connection with the Planning Commission. So um, that I assume that's me because uh, the neighbor actually came to my house and was talking about this project and I was up front with her saying two things. One, I'm a Planning Commissioner, so if you're going to talk about it, I want her to be aware of that. And secondly, I know the Estes just like I know about 60% plus people on Depot Hill. So. Um, you know, I just want to get that out there and uh, make sure everyone knows how that, that uh, came about and why that's in, in Frank's letter. I assume that is where that's coming from. So getting that off my chest and out there, I'll let somebody else speak now. Thank you, TJ. Linda? I'll jump in. <laughs> um, I think everybody knows I'm a real fan of historic preservation, and I have... Um, over the years tried to understand more about some of the Secretary of Interior standards because they're 
a lot of times they don't make sense to me. Um, this section of Depot Hill is critical, I think, to Capitola's history. I went up and down the street multiple times in multiple days trying to fathom um, this construction in the location that it's in. And massing is massing, and I think it, you can talk about landscaping like I can talk about massing, but when I look at the 124, um, I was not a big fan of that design in the first place, but now it really does look so big, and it was big to start with. And if we want the Depot Hill area to turn into that kind of construction, it's going to change the nature of the whole Central um, Avenue. So one of the things that I would need to see before I could approve this project would be um, the massing in some kind of orange fencing so you could actually see relative to the other cottages that are around it, how big is this going to be? Um, I don't understand all of the architectural technology that there is in making 3D models. Um, I was kind of hoping that we would have some kind of a physical model to look at that would better help me understand how big it is because I can't I can't logically look at that drawing and this picture and put them together and say this is what it's going to look like from the street and that's really what it's going to be. So I can't imagine what it's going to look like from the neighbor's backyard or from the guy behind it. And I think that taping that out or fencing that up in the air, like I think we've done that on, on Riverview um, when talking about historic buildings in the past. I'd really like to see that done. Um, I just want to address one of the comments about the photographs. I too am disappointed that we're seeing this photograph for the first time, but we have a resource in Capitola called the Capitola Museum, and it's it's there. Um, I think if we hire and pay a an architectural historian or historic architect to review um, potential historic resources in our community, that resource needs to be something that they utilize. Some, Leslie should have asked Frank for pictures a long time ago and then we wouldn't be sitting here. Based on what we saw, I would like to see it redesigned so that it's got the more historic flat roof. The, the drawing to me, it looks like a newer house that's down the street. Um, I don't believe that the one that I photographed was meant to look historic, it was just meant to be blend in. And when I look at this design, I don't see the history. It doesn't tell me the story of what Depot Hill in this area used to be. And I think that's what historic preservation is all about. Um, so the, the roof redesign, the massing, um, would both need to be done for me to even think about approving this project. Thank you, Linda. You want to go or Ed? you want me to? Let's keep going down the road. Okay. Um, okay. Well, I, I often think it's very difficult to read plans, you know, particularly when they're um, in uh, one dimensional and, and you don't see uh, how it's going to work, particularly for people who don't work with them a long time. And I can see, because um, I've known Carolyn for a lot of, time, lot of years and have worked with her, and uh, I have tremendous admiration for her. And, you know, I can understand where you might look at the front elevation and be concerned about the massing if you didn't understand how the depths and the distances were going to work. Um, I very much appreciate um, the uh, staff having the applicant, uh, you know, go the extra step to provide us with a little more information so it becomes clearer to a lay person how the property is going to be laid out. Um, I think they've, uh, uh, for me, I think the design works quite well. Um, uh, what people keep drumming into my head is that when uh, you walk through a historical neighborhood like Riverview Avenue, what you want to be able to do is look at the original cottages that were there and 
see the history that's on the street. Uh, and a number of those have small cottages in the front where major additions have been done behind them. And um, with this one, if the um, a roof line, I, I would need to see the roof line continue to be straight the way it was historically. And um, I think for the, the people who, who live in Capitola, that would identify it as a historic structure that's been preserved in the front and addition has been added on to the back of it. Uh, I like the fact that they have a 32 rear, foot rear yard setback because that does allow for light and air and sun uh, to be in the adjacent neighbor's yard since they have that large setback back there. Um, I'm sort of uh, rambling here a bit. Uh, I think they, they didn't, they've done an excellent job in preserving the historical house up front. As I said, I would like to see it with the straight roof going across and a new porch design and uh, the massing in the back uh, works for me. I think it's set significantly far enough back, 20 feet, so it's not going to overwhelm the, the cottage in the front. Thank you, Susan. Ed? Yeah. I'm done. <laughs> okay, so Thank you. what I really like about this planning commission is how we get so many different perspectives <laughs> in a problem. I mean, it's really, uh, it's good. Uh, we all come at it from different directions, and you know, I learn a lot anyway listening to the other planning commissioners. So um, first, on the um, Secretary of Interior standards, I've been railing about them ever since I got on the planning commission. Amen. I don't think their focus is very relevant to uh, Capitola. It's, uh, they, they focus a lot on what they call differentiation, for those who aren't familiar, which means that the new the new construction has to look like new construction. You can't make it look like the old construction, so somebody would be confused and think it's really part of the old building. And uh, I mean, I'm not, that is not the number one concern in Capitola as far as I, I'm concerned, our history. That might work for, say, Andrew Jackson's plantation or something like that, but I don't think it works for a community like Capitola. So it's kind of disappointing that all the historical research and reports focus on that issue because I don't think it's our issue. Um, as far as the variance, um, that's a, for me that's a non-issue in this case because we have many times found uh, historic, uh, protecting historic resources to be a justification, a special circumstance um, for a variance. So that's not the issue here. The issue is uh, the conditional use permit. And that's, that's really the tool that we've been given on a project like this to have a lot of uh, discretion in terms of all the different factors. And it specifically applies to a reconstruction of a historic building. So that's really um, the decision, in my opinion, is, is whether or not we, we should grant a conditional use permit as uh, these plans are presented or require something else. And that comes down to the, really comes down to the massing issue, which is a really tough one and it's very subjective, and it is hard to know for sure what it's going to look like when it's up. Um, there's, there's a balancing between pre preserving our history and <clears throat> realizing that the world keeps turning, and we are evolving, and we're intensifying, and we can't, this is not Bodie, California, where we're just preserving a little town that was there for the rest of eternity. We're, we're, we're growing, we're changing. Um, that's part of the history of Capitol is that it is always changing. And uh, there was a time when people were just living in tents here in the summer. So we couldn't just go back and say, well, you should just put a tent on your property there. So it's a balancing of uh, how far the redevelopment can go and against how much we want to preserve what Depot Hill looked like at one time. And I don't have a good answer for that yet. I want to maybe hear what our chairman has to say and then see how the further discussion goes. But um, I just have one more comment, not on the project so much, was Com Commissioner Welch's mention about the 
um, allegation that there was some someone had an inside track with the Planning Commission and um, that's the reason that I don't uh, entertain um, requests by applicants or anyone else to meet with them prior to the hearing and do it only in the public hearing I know every commissioner has their own system in that regard but uh, mine is basically uh, tell it to me in front of everybody else so and I, I think that helps mitigate that kind of a concern anyway I'm looking forward to hearing more thoughts right thank you Ed <laughs> um, and I guess those final thoughts would be mine um, as everyone has heard um, you know there's been uh, concerns expressed about the massing the roof line um, and, um, and and also concerns from the neighbors uh, about the overshadowing uh, of their property um, and my view is and oh, let me also speak a, a little bit about the variance request that, as I expressed before um, uh, I'm not sh I'm not sure if we do actually do those calculations as you know based on the ordinance so uh, again and I think that applies in this case so the variance is not a significant issue uh, for me um, I will say though when I first saw you know the design in the picture because I'm very familiar with the that uh, that street that neighborhood um, uh, and have lived it there many years it it does uh, kind of uh, jump out at me of as how large the addition is and compared to um, I think what we've all used to ha to have seen uh, over the years and decades um, and I think there has some expression here by commissioners um, and I would say close to a majority of them that they would maybe like to be able to see realistically what is this going to look like instead of just seeing uh, two-dimensional drawings what in real life will this turn out to be um, and I think that maybe we should take the time to do that to actually look at it before making a decision uh, at this point I think the question is here uh, truly about the massing uh, of the structure um, and um, and in, in, even though it, it does kind of I mean it, it, it to a bit it shocks me it stands out because I'm not used to it okay but with that said I'm not quite sure what our basis is for um, uh, determining what is the appropriate massing um, and um, um, but I think that we should certainly maybe start with um, maybe seeing if we could have some, can we have polls out there so that uh, the neighbors um, and we could actually go and see what is this really going to look like uh, in relationship to the historical structure that's there uh, could we maybe ask staff to look at well what kind of reasonable standards could we apply uh, you know being qualitative standards and I'm also sympathetic to the neighbors at 212 um, and I think at least they should be able to see in some realistic way okay what is the impacts on us um, and and what are the reasonable alternatives are there maybe some ways that that could be mitigated but I think that we need to maybe take the time uh, to look at those questions and answer it and maybe have it come back um, to the Planning Commission after that so um, I don't know how commissioners feel about that uh. I, I'll, uh, I'll jump back in here again um, I, I, I get that sometimes it's hard to I guess have a perspective I feel very comfortable with it I think the 3d rendering is great and even that rendering right there I think is I, I don't have an issue with that I, I think if you want to put it in perspective something you can see live go look on grand where the well now it's white it used to be blue where they left the historical house and put a detached second story a two-story house behind it which I think does not match at all I think this one goes along with trying to keep the historical preservation of the original uh, 400 square foot house while adding that second story and it ties in much better than the the house on, on grand so if I think if you I think it's very close if you look at size and massing to what that would look like uh, on the second story uh, you know, I always have a concern about and, and I think everyone here will say I'm consistent on this additional burdens on a uh, projects uh, and sometimes I get it it's subjective it's hard to make that that perspective I understand uh, the rotors uh, concerns I 
I would say about the uh, the roof design, actually having that hip roof is gonna be a benefit instead of a gable roof on that north elevation there because it's gonna allow su sunlight at a different, at a better angle. Um, also, because it is a west-facing, uh, both all those are west-facing houses, the sun actually in the afternoon goes right over the top of their back or towards the front of their yard, but it will have, uh, the, the proposed house will have no impact on the sun in the afternoon. Now, when it becomes uh, winter time, obviously there's gonna be an impact there. Uh, I get that. I, I don't see the sun really during the winter. I have uh, two lots and a single story house, but I have eucalyptus trees across the street and eucalyptus trees behind me. So uh, in the winter, we just don't get the same sun. And I, I, I'm empathetic to that. But at the same time, um, I don't know that it's gonna have, the house is gonna have that much a, of an impact. Personally, I'm ready to move forward with it. And it's probably no surprise to anybody here um, and, and not put more conditions on the owners. I, um, I understand the concern about massing, but really the massing was brought up initially by Carolyn Swift, who, God bless her, I, I respect her a lot, but that's not her background. And then Frank later came up, came up with it. But um, for me, I'm ready to make a motion to move forward with the project. Is that a motion? Uh, well, I will make a motion. I'll, I'll make a, a motion that we uh, approve the design permit, the conditional use permit, the major uh, revocable encroachment permit, uh, including the variance, and make one addition that um, the, the applicant works with Jan Deal. I'm, I keep saying Jan Deal. It's a lady I used to work with. Um, Leslie Deal to make that porch uh, more in line with what it was historically. Is there a second to the motion? Hearing none, the motion fails for lack of a second. Not a surprise. Is, is there uh, um, uh, another motion that commissioners would like to make? Well, I'm, I don't want to make, I'm, I'm not prepared to make a motion right now, but I'm, I'm quite confident that when the orange fencing goes up, that, you know, the massing is going to be appropriately set back from the historical building and um, you know having the 32 foot rear um, yard you know I, I don't I don't believe it's going to be a problem so I'm willing to to take the time um, to go through that step because um, you know what we're going to have is a neighborhood up there and neighbors living with each other and I think it's much easier to you know take a couple of weeks and and do this um, so that, that we see how it's going to work. So um, I guess we would be making a motion to continue this um, to allow the applicant um, time to, to put up the orange fencing. And, and I will tell you, you know, I think we need to be a little clear about what we're going to ask for because that's actually a fairly expensive thing to do. And, you know, if you want them to show every little in and out and how it's going to work, um, it, it gets even more complicated. So maybe we could, you know, come up with something about, um, you know, we're going to show, uh, you know, which particular wall, um, you know, are we going to show the orange fencing at the second floor setbacks, not the first floor. I mean, there are a lot of things we've got to decide rather than just saying we'll put up orange fencing all right good point susan i mean i think one of the in terms of one of the issues that has come up is concerning the massing of the structure i think in order to gauge that and see it we need to have the um the perimeter i mean uh, the um, the fencing going showing the uh, footprint of the addition um, and I think, I mean, I imagine in the height uh, of uh, the uh, addition. Um, now, I don't, I mean, is it possible to put in showing the setbacks on the second story? I assume that we could probably, uh, if that's possible to do, um, maybe that would be helpful for, uh, because I'm not just thinking about us, but it's the, it's the entire neighborhood, it's the community. Um, I think that what's different, TJ, is that this is a historical structure. 
um, and significantly historical to Capitola. And I just think that we should take the time and ask the applicant, let, let us all see it, okay, before we get into a situation like at what is at 124. I mean, that, and, uh, and so um, if it's possible to show the uh, second story setbacks with the fencing, um, then I think that we should do that as well. Um, and so, so I think that that's one request uh, that is being made by commissioners to do. Uh, the other, I heard discussions about a flatter uh, roof line. Um, so if um, the applicant maybe wanted to put some thoughts about attempting to do that and show that. We have this new evidence of the photograph of the porch, uh, trying to uh, stay true to that as best we can. Um, and and when I. When you say flatter roof line, you're talking about keeping the roof line in front. The porch right. entry, I think the you're talking about the, the front. The porch. Right. right. Well, it's, that was it's what you meant, Linda. Just the porch. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so those are, those are some of the things that I heard. Um, but um, I think this is just one I think is worthwhile to take the effort to um, uh, have everyone see it as, as best they can on location. Uh, and I would also like to ask staff, I mean, going back to my question, okay, yeah, if we do that, and now we have a sense of the massing, but what standards do we use? But that I think then Commissioner Newman's right. They're not standards for massing. It, it, the, the judgment subjective. Well, <laughs> is it's subjective. And, um, well, and it's relative to the area that it's in, too, because um, it... Right. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, my concern is that then we come up with our own, each individual, and right. it just becomes, a, a, you know, a, a personal view about, you know, so what what's the, appropriate. What the uh, code says about a conditional use permit is that the commission shall give due regard to the nature and condition of all adjacent uses and structures. Mm -hmm. So that's well. kind of take the neighborhood into account. Okay. And there needs to make, be a finding that there's no impact to the historic structure. So, uh, it, well, uh, I guess well. this is my trouble with this. Isn't that what uh, Leslie Deal did? I, I guess this is my thing. We, we require our applicants to jump through all these hoops with uh, this third-party person, Leslie Deal, to talk about keeping the, the historical component, and yet now we're, we're, it's like we're second-guessing that. She doesn't. She's not the planning commission. She, no, I, I, she's no, a, I, a tool I, I understand she's a tool, but the, it's an expensive tool. <laughs> and so now we're going to be subjective and override this, uh, this expensive well, tool. That's well, my, let, that's let's, my not, let's not make the assumption that we're going to override it. No, no, I, I, I'm I, just saying so it's, it becomes yeah, subjective right. when that's a tool that we require the applicants to pay for. So, so well, I, I, well, to me, I, I think that that is. Her, her assessment is very relevant to me, and you know, and, and I would give that a great deal of credence in the ultimate decision. But I don't know if it ends and stops there for us because I don't know that Understood. she's local here. She's applying local standards, uh, and as well considering you know the neighborhoods, uh, the neighbors, and their impacts. Because so, I want to look at those in addition to the historical architectural standards and so um, I, I don't want to I don't think in that any way dismisses her conclusions I, I think that will come back as well and we will have that so, so. Well, I can I can support the uh, procrastination uh, motion here okay. <laughs> would you like to make the procrastination <laughs> motion but, uh, first let me say that I, personally I don't uh, it, that front porch is not a big issue to me and the evidence is uh, inconclusive enough that I would make a big deal out of it. Um, my main reason, it, as I said, it's a close call and there's such strong views on both sides, I would hate to just really jump into a decision where those who are on the other side are gonna be very unhappy with uh, us doing that without at least taking it another step. So yeah, I'll move the uh, second alternative that we continue the application with the request that the um, uh, building be shown with netting, the two-story portion mm -hmm. of the building. And then we come back uh, at the next uh, hearing, which would be in, uh, do we have a, a meeting in August? We have a meeting in two weeks, on oh, two August weeks. 2nd. Oh, okay. so. Can, can we, that be done that quickly? You can continue weeks? it to that date. If they're unable to uh, okay. get the netting in time, we'll continue right. it again. I'll second the motion. Okay. 
Okay, so uh, right. September yeah, so 6th. We didn't yeah. hear anything after that. So there's a motion. Uh, it's been seconded by Commissioner uh, Smith. Um, any further discussion? Hearing none, uh, let's have a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Newman? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Welch? No. Commissioner Westman? Yes. Commissioner, I'm sorry, Chairperson Story? Yes. So that motion passes, um, and we do, we do look forward to having you come back with uh, the, the applic your application. And thank you. That brings us to the uh, item five, which is the director's to report. Um, have I, anything to report? I have a couple things to report this okay. evening. Um, good news is I've been working with the Coastal Commission quite closely on the zoning code update, and our last, the past meeting that we had this Wednesday, they are going to have final comments to me on, we've worked through a lot of issues. We got it down to 10 items. Wow. Um, and they're going to have final red lines to me, hopefully by September 1st. And then from there we'll be um, making a decision of whether or not to take their red lines and submit them to the Coastal Commission with red lines so the Coastal Commission can see exactly what they've asked for. Um, or if there are big ticket items that we need to re-look at policies, bring it back to Planning Commission and City Council for further tweaks. And um, so depending on what I receive in red lines, you will, I'll be reporting back. So this is the zoning ordinance without the geological hazard. Correct. Project. The uh, other good news is that we were awarded a grant for to update our um, hazard mitigation plan. Oh, nice. So I've also been talking to the Coastal Commission about can we please um, hold off on our geological hazards until we've gone through our LHMP update in which we can utilize that tool, go out to the public, talk about geological hazards and bring that back as a separate modification to the zoning code. So that, that's the update on the zoning code. Um, next, the Seritage appeal came in um, after the last hearing. They did not have much availability in the near future, so that's going to be heard in October. October 25th, it is my understanding th that they have submitted for a facility closure permit at the county, um, but other than that, I have no other updates for you on that project. And those were the two items I wanted to bring up to date on this evening. A facility closure permit? For the closing of the automotive. The environmental. Oh, okay. The county permit. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, that was September's? Um, October 25th. October 25th, okay. okay. Any other commission communications? Yes, yeah. I, I'd like to ask if the staff could put in a requisition to get me a new. <laughs> um, Ready? Is that in our budget? <laughs> <laughs> and I'd like to say I'm not going to be here at the August meeting. Okay. Right. I'd like to just give a heads up. I may not make the October meeting. Okay. And welcome to our new employees. What, I guess yeah. we're left. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. With that, I'll adjourn this meeting. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, staff.